In November 1961, a secret meeting of leading government-sponsored astronomers was held to estimate the number of planets in our own galaxy with intelligent life. These scientists concluded that there are probably 40 to 50 million intelligent extraterrestrial civilizations in our galaxy alone. There is ever-increasing evidence that some of these extraterrestrial civilizations are visiting the Earth. You are seeing an unidentified flying object. It is not a hoax. It is real. The film was taken by Leland Hansen while filming Catalina Island from a helicopter. Mr. Hansen was a professional photographer working for the United States Navy. This film has been examined by photographic experts. Photographic analysis reveals that this circular UFO was about 30 feet in diameter and was traveling between 130 and 170 miles per hour. It has no wings, no tail section, and no visible means of propulsion. Mr. Hansen also observed this object hovering stationary in the air before it began to move. This sighting is only one of the many pieces of evidence the producers of this film will present verifying that some UFOs are extraterrestrial spacecraft. We will reveal formerly classified secret documents which clearly demonstrate that the government has knowledge of the extraterrestrial origin of some UFOs and is trying to keep this fact secret. You will see documented evidence depicting the appearance of the alien beings who pilot these UFOs. And we will present our conclusions as to what purpose these alien beings have in visiting the Earth. While in space as command pilot on Gemini 5, astronaut General James McDivitt saw an unidentified object approach his spacecraft and then move away when he tried to film it. One astronaut who actually chased a UFO while a fighter pilot in Germany in 1951 is Colonel Gordon Cooper. One of the original seven Mercury astronauts, Colonel Cooper sent this letter to the United Nations November 9th, 1978 to express his view on UFOs. I believe that these extraterrestrial vehicles and their crews are visiting this planet from other planets, which obviously are a little more technically advanced than we are here on Earth. I am somewhat qualified to discuss them, since I have been into the fringes of the vast areas in which they travel. Also, I did have occasion in 1951 to have two days of observation of many flights of them of different sizes flying in fighter formation, generally from east to west over Europe. They were at a higher altitude than we could reach with our jet fighters of that time. We are showing you this film at one half its original speed. This unidentified flying object was photographed by James Waters. Toward the middle of the extreme right of the frame, you will see a second UFO that appears briefly. As we slow the film, you can see that the UFO appears to change shape from frame to frame. The object photographed was flying at a faster speed 
than any conventional jet fighter can achieve at this low altitude. Now you will see the Colorado film at its original speed five times in rapid succession. This series of three Polaroid pictures was taken by Rex Heflin. The presence in the photograph of objects such as telephone poles, whose size and distance can easily be measured, makes possible a detailed analysis of these photos. This analysis indicates that the disc-shaped object was approximately 30 feet in diameter. Mr. Heflin has never tried to use these pictures to gain publicity or profit. Another picture of a similar disc-shaped object was taken by Mr. Emil Barnea 7,000 miles away and three years later. Six years after that, another UFO, also remarkably similar to the one that Mr. Heflin photographed, was photographed in Yugoslavia. In a 1978 Gallup poll, 68% of Americans who expressed an opinion said that they believed UFOs are real. That poll also revealed the higher the level of education, the more likely a person is to believe that UFOs are real. 13 million adult Americans believe that they have seen a UFO. This is an official UFO sighting report detailing the observation of a UFO by 10 to 12 people for approximately 10 minutes. The sighting was reported by one of the witnesses, President Jimmy Carter, while governor of Georgia. It could not have been a planet, a star, meteor or aircraft. The president of Brazil, Mr. Kubitschek, released these four pictures. They were taken by Mr. Baranha, a professional photographer on board a Brazilian Navy ship that was participating in the International Geophysical Year. The UFO was seen by dozens of other witnesses on board the ship. Computer analysis of these photographs indicates that the UFO was a large, Saturn-shaped object a great distance from the camera. Similar Saturn-shaped UFOs have been photographed in other parts of Brazil and on the other side of the world. One of the most active UFO investigators we discovered in our research is retired Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Wendell Stevens. Colonel Stevens spent 23 years on active duty in the United States Air Force as a pilot. He specialized in air technical intelligence and the design of advanced aircraft. He was a graduate of the Army Air Corps First Test Pilot School and at the age of 20 was a project officer on the P-47 fighter plane. 
II, he flew in combat and was a test pilot. Colonel Stevens is still an active pilot. After World War II, he was assigned to an air base in Alaska, where he debriefed B-29 crews who frequently described encounters with strange circular aircraft. My first experience with uh, a UFO report, personal experience that is, was when one of the crews returned and said that they saw a bogey, that's what they called them, up there that was uh, moving at high speed at higher altitude than they could fly. And uh, the crews later, I found out that often, they often referred to them as, as enemy aircraft or Russian aircraft, but usually bogeys. And they tried to describe it, but it moved at, at faster speeds than anything we had. We didn't have jet airplanes then. Later, we measured one that was flying 7,000 miles an hour, measured it on radar. So these clearly exceeded any of our capabilities in 1940s, any capabilities of anybody in the world in 1947. On an average of about twice a month, I would get some kind of a UFO report, and they would see these circular craft, sometimes close, sometimes far, sometimes more than one. I remember uh, a crew describing one sitting on the, on the ice pack. And this is something we couldn't do. We didn't have any way to land up there. And they seemed to be operating in airspace without a visible support base. It took a fantastic base for us to maintain the B-29s, just to support them flying in the Arctic. I even had one crew describe one that they saw underwater that surfaced, rose off the water, and flew away. Now, this clearly exceeded any design capabilities that we knew of in the world. The B-29s flying these reconnaissance missions were equipped with a variety of cameras. At various times, they got pictures of these UFOs seen in the Arctic airspace on various of the cameras and sometimes on all of the cameras. At least this is what they reported. I never got to see any of it because we took the film cartridges out, packed it in the box, and shipped it off to Washington, to Andrews Air Force Base, where the officer was met by Pentagon intelligence and taken someplace. I never got any feedback on any of this. I never heard what they developed out of it, but the stories were fantastic. This formally classified letter written by General Nathan Twining, was the result of numerous UFO sightings by Air Force pilots such as Colonel Stevens described. Concerning flying disc reports, General Twining states, and we quote, the phenomenon reported is something real and not visionary or fictitious. There are objects, probably approximately the shape of a disc, of such appreciable size as to appear to be as large as man-made aircraft. The reported operating characteristics, such as extreme rates of climb, maneuverability, must be considered evasive when sighted. Some of the objects are controlled either manually, automatically, or remotely. The apparent common description of the object is as follows. Metallic or light reflecting surface, circular or elliptical in shape, flat on the bottom and domed on the top. End quote. This report makes it abundantly clear that the United States military knew of the reality of flying saucers and deliberately kept it a secret. Not Colonel Stevens went on to tell us about two other experiences with UFOs while he was on active duty with the U.S. Air Force. I, I know of uh, Lieutenant Colonel, for instance, who was pursuing a, a UFO in an F-86 with a wingman with him, and he armed his camera, which involves the arming switch for guns and everything else on, on the airplane. It goes through an armament fire control panel. This man lives within 60 miles of here. He armed the, the fire control panel to, to take camera pictures with his camera guns, and the whole panel began to smoke, and, went, and all the electrical systems in it went out. When he got back to base, they found wires fused in it and could find no reason for it being fused. It took him two weeks to repair the airplane. But he had a visual lock-on, a visual contact with the UFO, could see with his eyes. It was close enough to see detail and structure on it and wanted to film it with his gun cameras. My next experience with what was probably a, a real UFO was in 1960 when I was a squadron commander in Florida. I had a, a squadron test pilot up on a flight test mission with an F-100 and a max performance climb test. He was climbing through 18,000 feet when he saw an object ahead and above him that looked like the Goodyear blimp. And he thought, oh my God, what can this be? And he knows, we all know that a Goodyear blimp can't get that high. He went into afterburner 
to catch up to it, and he began to close momentarily on the thing, and then it began to only pace it, and then it speeded up and just walked away from him, climbing away at a steep angle above him in an F-100 in afterburner, climbing at max speed. That's the fastest airplane we got at the time. He last saw it speeding away from him above 33,000 feet. There's no way in the world any blimp can get up there. And he came back and he told me about this experience. He was white. He was, it was a traumatic thing because he realized, everybody would realize under the conditions, it's something unearthly. Something unearthly is a good way to describe this unidentified flying object that was photographed by Mr. Paul Trent when he and another witness saw it fly across his farm. These two pictures have been the subject of some of the most rigorous photographic analysis ever done on UFO photographs. One such analysis was published by Dr. Bruce McAbee, an optical physicist involved in advanced laser research for the United States Navy. He calculated that the object would have been about a mile away and approximately 30 feet in diameter. My analysis of the complete case leads me to believe that the Trents are actually telling the truth. An unusual object did fly at some distance from their farm. It would have been uh, quite large, and its shape is such that I don't believe it was made by mankind. Additional support for the McMinnville photograph comes from this photograph of a strikingly similar object taken four years later and 6,000 miles away by a French military pilot. The similarity is so pronounced that one might think that these photographs are of the same object or of two different objects manufactured at the same place. This remarkable series of pictures taken by Roy Lauritsen destroys the myth that UFOs are never seen over big cities. The original negative of this film strip has been examined by an experienced UFO researcher and found to be in its original uncut state. This greatly reduces any possibility of fraud. There is only a vacant lot where Mr. Lauritsen stood when he took these pictures. He was not standing behind a window. The object is not a reflection. In spite of considerable harassment, professional pilots continue to come forward with their accounts of incredible encounters with UFOs. Inventor and author Dr. Richard Haynes is seen here working with his computerized research file of over 3,000 UFO sightings by commercial and military pilots. Because good eyesight and sharp abilities of observation are required to become a professional pilot, Dr. Haynes believes that the testimony of these credible witnesses cannot be ignored. We're not dealing with mental projections or hallucinations on the part of the witness, but with a real physical phenomenon. One of the most thoroughly investigated cases in Dr. Haynes' file involves the near collision of a UFO with a United States Army helicopter piloted by Lieutenant Colonel Lawrence Coyne and his crew. While flying over Mansfield, Ohio at 11 p.m. on October 18, 1973, they observed a bright red object which parallel their craft and then rapidly move toward them on a collision course. I looked out the window and observed this light moving at a very excessive speed, in excess of 600 knots. Coming at the helicopter, it looked like a locked-on missile. A family of five in a car observed the strange red object on a collision course with Colonel Coyne's helicopter. They pulled off the road to watch. The thing that makes this particular evening a unique experience was that it was almost a mere collision with an object that we, or you know, as a UFO. We did not know it was such until it was on top of the helicopter, and that took just a matter of minutes. Colonel Coyne put the helicopter into a dive to try to avoid impact. When he and his crew looked up, the object was keeping pace with them. While it was in this position, uh, the green light came at from the undercarriage of the UFO. 
Colonel Coyne cut the power and set the controls for a steep dive. In spite of this, the helicopter was pulled upward toward the UFO from an altitude of 1,700 feet to an altitude of above 3,700 feet. Colonel Coyne and his crew observed the strange UFO at close range for approximately two minutes. The object that I viewed that particular evening uh, had a high degree of technology. It was composed of a structure and a design that we do not have. The object can move through the atmosphere without causing any turbulence. It can move at high speeds, below 10,000 feet. There are no vertical or horizontal stabilizers, no landing gear, no source of propulsion reflected on the craft. Looks like it, it, it could go fly in space. This document is the result of years of investigation into Lieutenant Colonel Coyne's helicopter encounter with a UFO. It verifies the facts just presented to you. Lieutenant Colonel Coyne felt so strongly about his UFO experience that he became part of a delegation to the United Nations that tried to encourage the UN to deal with the subject of UFOs. Increasingly, UFOs have become the subject of serious investigation by professional scientists. One of the 12 scientists to give evidence before the U.S. congressional hearings on UFOs is California nuclear physicist Stanton Friedman, who spent 14 years in private industry working extensively on classified government-sponsored projects such as this nuclear rocket engine and other advanced space systems. Since 1970, he is the only space scientist known to be devoting full time to UFOs. After 21 years of study and investigation, I'm convinced that the evidence is simply overwhelming, that our planet Earth is being visited by intelligently controlled vehicles whose origin is off the Earth. In other words, some UFOs, underlying the sum about 10 times, are somebody else's spacecraft. Now, I'm only concerned with those UFO reports which indicate things of definite size, shape, surface texture, whose behavior clearly indicates that they were manufactured somewhere other than Earth. The kind of behavior that Stanton Friedman is talking about is the ability to go 10,000 miles per hour in the atmosphere as observed on radar and make sharp right angle turns nobody on planet Earth is able to duplicate that behavior. The observation of UFOs is by no means a recent phenomenon. Listen to this account by a Roman soldier written in 98 AD. At sunset, a burning shield passed over the sky at Rome. It sparkled from the west and passed to the east. The Roman soldier's description of that burning shield matches very closely what was photographed in Salt Lake City by Mr. Lauritsen in 1972. On September 30th, 1870, the London Times published this article. The object was elliptical in shape with a kind of tail it crossed the moon from one side to the other in half a minute. This picture was taken in Switzerland over 100 years after that report. This description was written in 216 BC. At a pari east of Rome, a round shield was seen in the sky. Another manuscript dated 1290 A.D. recorded this UFO sighting. They all rushed out into the open and behold, there was an awful thing. A nearly circular object of silver appearance, not unlike a discus, flying above them all. It excited amongst all the greatest terror. These ancient sightings are not isolated cases. This modern film seems to fit another ancient account almost exactly. There appeared in the sky a brilliant object like an iron bar, long and wide as half the moon. 
For 15 minutes, it hovered motionless. Then suddenly, the strange object began to rise in spirals and twist and writhe like the uncoiled mainspring of a watch. And after, it vanished in the sky. That account was written on All Saints Day, November 1st, 1461. But it could almost as easily have been written describing this film, taken near New Zealand by a television news crew on December 31st, 1978. This UFO was observed by five witnesses beside the cameraman who photographed it while flying in an airplane. It was also observed on two ground-based radar sets and on the radar in the airplane. Perhaps the most interesting part of the entire New Zealand film is this unexplainable frame. During this section of the film, the UFO not only changes size and shape, but changes color from red to white. Dr. Bruce Maccabee has conducted the most thorough investigation of this UFO case. He has interviewed extensively all the witnesses and has analyzed the film frame by frame. I have concluded that the film does not show Venus or Jupiter. It does not show meteors or mating mutton birds. It does not show secret military maneuvers or the squid fishing fleet. I have concluded that the film is not a hoax. My investigation of this whole case leads me to believe that the film shows a real, unidentified flying object. There's a clipping service that publishes an average of 60 pages a month of UFO sighting reports gathered from newspapers. By only occasionally reporting a UFO sighting, the mass media creates the mistaken belief that UFO observations are rare and separated by years. This is untrue. UFO activity is a continuing phenomenon on a worldwide scale. UFOs have not only been observed in the air, thousands of people from almost every part of the world have reported seeing UFOs on or just above the ground. This is a photograph of a UFO landing site. Ted Phillips of Sedalia, Missouri, seen here examining a UFO-affected area, is acknowledged as the world expert on the physical traces found at UFO landing sites. Mr. Phillips is a research associate of the Center for UFO Studies and has conducted specialized research on the physical traces found at UFO landing sites for the past nine years. The results of his research are files on over 1,480 UFO landings from 59 countries. Mr. Phillips has personally investigated over 500 UFO sightings and visited over 300 UFO landing sites. These are soil samples taken from five recent UFO landing sites and are fairly representative of uh, some two to 300 UFO landing sites that I have personally been involved with. This is a small portion of the soil taken from a UFO landing site in Delphos, Kansas. The soil in the UFO landing ring is extremely dehydrated and is unable to absorb water. Instead, it simply floats. 
soil taken only a few feet away that was not part of the UFO landing ring behaved normally. Within a few seconds, it absorbed the water that we poured on it. Besides being unable to absorb water, UFO-affected soil cannot support seed germination and plant life. Soil taken a few feet away does support normal plant growth. Each of the pins in this map represents a UFO landing site that has been reported to Ted Phillips in the last eight years. There are over 150 UFO landing sites represented on this map. I've investigated a rather high percentage of these reports personally and have found a remarkable consistency in size and shape uh, regarding the UFO scene and the ground effects resulting from that UFO landing. We find imprints left evidently by the landing gear of the object, some of these indicating tremendous pressure, uh, great weight, generally uh, found as three or four in number, arranged in either a triangular or rectangular pattern. We have effects on witnesses, such as the witnesses suffering what appears to be a sunburn effect on their face, neck, and hands, following the close approach of a UFO, extreme dryness of the nasal area, extreme dryness of the throat. I have talked with nearly 2,000 people who have had a UFO experience, and those people uh, certainly have convinced me that something very real is going on. Something real is indeed going on. No matter how vivid a hallucination is, it cannot dehydrate soil. 80% of the descriptions of a UFO in Ted Phillips' files are of a disc-shaped object between 10 and 35 feet in diameter. Over 400 of the landing cases in these files involve more than one witness observing a UFO for longer than one minute at a distance of less than 250 feet. We're talking about people, uh, police officers, clergymen, newsmen, business people, people in all walks of life from all parts of the country who have had real UFO experiences, and in many cases a very close range. The interesting thing is that these people could witness a murder, could go into court, testify to that effect, put a, a man away for life, and yet, those same people have a UFO experience and their testimony is no longer valid. That's certainly a very strange uh, set of double standards that we have in this country. It's difficult to... Another UFO investigator whose research has convinced him that UFOs are real is Colonel Wendell Stevens. I need proof for myself. And I look for proof in everything that happened. The, a number of things happened in, the, in Alaska that add a lot, a lot to my belief patterns. But then when I got to investigating my own cases and could look people in the eye, and I, and I investigated some cases that were profound cases, then I became convinced that there's something here. And the something that's here, at least a part of the something that's here is physical, it's tangible. It's just like the car sitting out there in the street. You can go up and thump it. The evidence is overwhelming that indeed something is here, and it is physical, and it is extraterrestrial. of lecturing all over the continent, I have talked now to more than 90 former military people who have told me of excellent sightings that occurred while they were in the service and where the data didn't go to the old Project Blue Book, which we were told was the only government group concerned with UFOs, but instead typically went to the Aerospace Defense Command or the National Security Agency and where the security lid was clamped down immediately. Now, I've heard so many of these stories that I'm either having to say that all of these people are lying, or that we're dealing with the Cosmic Watergate. Cosmic Watergate is an accurate way to describe the United States government's official reaction to UFOs. 
The sharp difference between the FBI's public statements about UFOs and their real actions is a good example of this. J. Edgar Hoover wrote several letters stating that the investigation of unidentified flying objects is not and never has been within the jurisdiction of the FBI. J. Edgar Hoover successfully kept the FBI's UFO file secret until 1976, when Dr. Bruce McAbee received part of the FBI UFO file as a result of his Freedom of Information Act request. Here are the documents that were released. There are over a thousand pages which provide information on the FBI's and the Air Force's secret investigations of UFOs. This startling document was recovered from the FBI's secret file. It is in J. Edgar Hoover's own handwriting. In response to a government request to investigate UFOs, Mr. Hoover wrote, and we quote, I would do it, but before agreeing to do it, we must insist upon full access to disks recovered. For instance, in the LA case, the Army grabbed it and would not let us have it for cursory examination. End quote. This memo clearly indicates that Mr. Hoover considered UFOs a very serious subject that should receive top-level security. One of the events that may have contributed to the opinions reflected in Mr. Hoover's memo is the apparent recovery of the wreckage of a crashed UFO by the United States Army. This happened on July 8, 1947, and involves Major Jesse Marcel, who was, at that time, the intelligence officer at Roswell, New Mexico Army Air Force Base, the only atomic bomb wing in the world. Major Marcel is a combat veteran who shot down five enemy planes in World War II. A local rancher brought Major Marcel to a crash site located on a remote area of his ranch. They were astonished to find the vast amount of wreckage. One thing I was certain of, being familiar with all air activities, that it was not a weather balloon, nor an aircraft, nor a missile. It was something else of which we didn't know what it was. There were just fragments strewn all over the area, an area about three quarters of a mile long and several hundred feet wide. So we proceeded to pick up the parts. A lot of it had a lot of little members with symbols that to me I call them hieroglyphics because I could not interpret them, could not be read. They were just like symbols of something that meant something. These little members could not be broken, could not be burned. I, I even tried to burn that, would not burn. See, that stuff weighs nothing. It's not in there thicker than tinfoil in a pack of cigarettes. He says, I tried to bend this stuff. He says, it will not bend. He says, we did all we could to bend it. It would not bend. He says, we even tried making a dent in it with a 16-pound sledgehammer. He says, still no dent in it. A woman working in a radio station in Albuquerque, New Mexico, started to transmit on a news wire the story of Major Marcel's recovery of a crashed flying saucer. The FBI interrupted that communication with the statement, do not continue this transmission. An official Army press release was put out announcing the capture of portions of a flying saucer. Major Marcel escorted the wreckage on a B-29 to Carswell Air Force Base. The press was waiting for him, but he was told not to say anything by his commander, General Ramey. The newsmen saw very little of that material, a very small portion of it. And none of the important things, like these uh, members that had these hieroglyphics or, or markings on, they wanted me to tell them about it, and I couldn't say anything. And when the general came in, he told me not to say anything, that he would handle it. The reason that this story has remained hidden from the public for over 30 years is that General Ramey released a cover story at that point saying that the crashed flying saucer was really a weather balloon. The press around the world accepted that statement. The documented testimony of one of Major Marcel's B-29 crew members reveals that the UFO wreckage was removed from their B-29 by armed guards and placed on another aircraft. This seems rather strange treatment for the wreckage of a weather balloon. 
More than two dozen people in New Mexico associated with the UFO-related events of July 1947 have been interviewed. We have verified every statement made by Jesse Marcel. A well-respected New Mexican engineer, Barney Barnett, has reported that a flying saucer crashed just outside of Socorro, New Mexico in early July 1947. Since this is the same date and very close to the location where Major Marcel recovered a crashed UFO, it seems probable that the crashed UFO Mr. Barnett reported is a larger piece of the crashed UFO Major Marcel recovered. Mr. Barnett saw a number of dead alien bodies extracted from that wreckage. He was accompanied by members of an archaeological expedition. A military group came along, swore everybody to secrecy, and carried off the saucer and the dead alien bodies. Between 1947 and 1952, there were more flying saucer sightings in New Mexico than in any other state. This document, recovered from the FBI's secret file, shows that during this time period there were over 150 sightings of UFOs over sensitive U.S. military installations. Many of these sightings fit the standard disc-shaped UFO description and were reported by more than one reliable witness. New Mexico was the state where all post-World War II rocket shots were fired. It is also the state where the first atom bomb was developed and tested. One logical explanation for this large number of UFO sightings is that an alien space traveling culture was observing the Earth without making official contact and gathering military intelligence on the Earth so that they will be prepared for the day when we leave this planet and move into space. The best known government responses to the UFO question were the much publicized U.S. Air Force's Project Blue Book and the Condon Report. In spite of the Air Force's public statements to the contrary, a close examination of the evidence in these reports indicates that some UFOs are extraterrestrial spacecraft and that the purpose of these reports was to act as public relations cover-ups rather than scientific studies. During the past 10 years, I've talked with uh, over two dozen military personnel who have confidentially uh, relayed cases involving uh, not only landings very near or on military installations in this country, but also cases involving physical residue. In one instance, uh, an individual assured me that he had personally seen to the transmission of this report to Project Blue Book, and this was a report involving a landing and quite a number of, of witnesses, security personnel. And if one is to check the Blue Book files, the files that have been opened to the public, those cases are not there, not a single case. Colonel Stevens gave us a good explanation as to why military people and former military people do not speak out about their classified experiences with UFOs. Now, when a, when a person working in a security field leaves the field, he's uh, reminded of his oaths and he's sworn not to reveal information uh, handled officially during the time of his tenure in this, that particular security thing, and he's warned of the penalties. It's a $10,000 fine and 10 years in prison, and for, in, in extreme cases, forfeiture of all pay and allowances due or ever to become due. And so it's hard to find people who are not vulnerable, who don't have something to lose by telling what happened to them. The encounter of two Iranian jets with a UFO gives a glimpse of how the government really handles good quality UFO military sightings. The lead fighter tried to intercept an extremely large, bright UFO. As he closed with the UFO, his electrical missile control and communication systems malfunctioned. He turned away from the UFO, and shortly thereafter, his systems began to function normally again. The 
White House, the CIA, and several other defense intelligence agencies received a classified letter describing the case in detail. This memo, written by General Carol H. Bolander in 1969, became public in 1979 and revealed that reports of unidentified flying objects which could affect national security were not part of the Blue Book system. It is clear that the government regards UFOs as a matter of national security because they can fly rings around our conventional jets or rockets. The first country to be able to duplicate the behavior of UFOs could attack any other country in the world with absolute immunity. You see, the single most important aspect of a flying saucer, from a government or military viewpoint, is its potential for military utilization. The first country to be able to duplicate the behavior of flying saucer will rule the planet. These recently released secret CIA UFO files indicate intense government interest in the military potential of UFOs. These files establish that the CIA had agents all around the world gathering information on UFOs. This interview with Senator Barry Goldwater provides an even clearer view of the government's concern about the military potential of UFOs. Senator Goldwater was the Republican candidate for president in 1964 and is a major general in the United States Air Force Reserve. We have verified the following quotes. Air Force, Navy, and commercial pilots have revealed to me cases when a UFO would fly near them, right off the plane's wing, and then just zoom away at incredible speeds. I asked General Curtis LeMay, who for years was head of the Strategic Air Command, for permission to check into the files. And he told me, hell no, and don't ask me again. I think some highly secret government UFO investigations are going on that we don't know about, and probably never will unless the Air Force discloses them. Someday soon, someone is going to have strong UFO evidence that can't be explained away. End Senator Goldwater's quote. There is already strong evidence that can't be explained away in Senator Barry Goldwater's own home state of Arizona. The evidence revolves around an incident that took place in the Sitgraves National Forest. It was in this location that a young woodcutter named Travis Walton was abducted by a UFO. The UFO was witnessed by six of his fellow workers. At Travis's home in Snowflake, Arizona, we interviewed him and one of the witnesses to the UFO, Mike Rogers. There were seven of us on the way home from work. Uh, we were riding down a dirt road in a pickup and uh, we saw an object hovering off to the side of the road. It was a glowing disc-shaped object. It was about uh, 90 feet away. It was hovering about, I'd say, 15 to 20 feet off the ground. I got out of the truck and went closer. I wanted to get a closer look at it. And I realized for the first time what, what he was doing, and I realized that it was dangerous. I expected it to, you know, fly away when I got closer. But instead, when I, when I got up there, it, it started to move and, and to make a, a loud sound, which scared me. I yelled at him, and I told him, you know, get the hell away from there. I raised up and turned to go, and then all of a sudden, the object uh, apparently uh, blasted him with some sort of a ray or, or bolt of light or something. I felt a numbing shock and lost consciousness, and that was the last I knew until I woke up aboard the craft. When I saw this bright, blinding light, I turned back just in time to see Travis flying back through the air. He hit the ground about 10 feet or so from where he had been standing. At that point, uh, with the 
the blast that the saucer had given him it was such an incredible thing. It was just unbelievable. I was in an instant panic. Uh, the guys behind me, somebody says, get the hell out of here. So I hit the gas and we took off down the road. Mike Rogers and the other five witnesses returned only to find Travis missing. After they told their astounding story to the police, they came under suspicion of murder. An intense search for Travis Walton proceeded for three days using a large posse, dogs, and helicopters. They were unable to find him or any signs of where he was. Finally, it was suggested that the six witnesses take a polygraph test to establish the truth or fallacy of their story. We told them, you know, we'll take polygraph tests, we'll, we'll take sodium pentothal, uh, hypnosis, anything you can give us, because this thing really happened, and, and uh, we don't like this thing about you accusing us of murder, which several of them had openly. Arrangements were made for Cy Gilson, a highly qualified polygraph examiner who was a member of the Arizona State Polygraph Association to conduct the polygraphs on the six witnesses to Travis Walton's UFO encounter. The utmost care in administering these lie detector tests was exercised because the men were under suspicion of murder. Once the test got underway, uh, he started changing his mind very quickly. After he had tested about three of the, of the six, uh, he seemed to be acting differently. By the time he had tested all of us, he seemed to be a believer. I talked to him after the tests, and he indicated to me that that apparently he was wrong. Uh, unofficially, he said uh, that he believed that we had told the truth because uh, five of us passed the test. He wrote in his report that we had told the truth, that apparently there had been a UFO. This was a very emotional thing for Travis's family and emotional for us. Travis was my best friend, and our whole lives have been disrupted by this. We wondered if we would ever see him again. When I regained consciousness, I was laying on my back. I, uh, I came to slowly. Um, I was in a lot of pain in my head and chest area. At first, I thought I was in a hospital. But when I could finally see, I, I saw these beings standing over me, and it, I just became hysterical. They were about five feet tall. They had no hair, no eyelashes, eyebrows, and very large heads, very large eyes. The rest of their features, uh, nose, mouth, and ears were small, and uh, they were very white looking. I knocked them away from me, and... Uh, jumped off of the table there, and uh, they started to come toward me. And I grabbed an object off of the bench there and threatened them. They stopped and turned around and left the room. Um, I was afraid they'd come back, so I left there uh, looking for a way out. I went into another room where there was a chair. It was some kind of a projection or some kind of a viewing thing in this room where you could see a map of the stars. A man came in while I was trying to find a way out there. And this was a, a human-looking person. They had passed in a crowd, uh, this individual, and on Earth. He was bigger than me, taller, and more muscular. A very large individual. I went up and uh, tried to talk to this guy, and uh, he didn't answer me. He led me outside of this craft that I was in, which was apparently parked inside of a large room or a building or a larger craft, and led me out of this room into another room where some other beings like himself uh, put me unconscious. When I regained consciousness, I found myself laying on the roadway 
that I saw a craft hovering there that just sat there for a second and just shot straight up. That's the last I've seen of I ran down into the town there and called my family, and they came and got me. When I did hear that he had been returned, it was almost as unbelievable as the original thing because he had been gone so long. One of the biggest shocks I had to deal with when I was returned was finding out that this brief period of time had somehow taken over five days. When I found out I'd been gone for that long, it was, it was just, you know, blew me away. My, my brother, you know, told me about it, and, and I was stunned, and he, he asked me to feel my face, and I'd had a, I had a, you know, a week's growth, and I was, really took my mind just to reeled at that, because as far as I knew, it was the same night. The thing that bothered me most about the whole experience was those eyes. When they looked at me, they just seemed like they were looking right through me. You just can't understand how it would be if it were just right there. After his return, Travis Walton also passed a polygraph test verifying the truth of his UFO experience. To obtain an expert opinion on what conclusions could be drawn from the polygraph tests in the Travis Walton case, we interviewed Edward Gelb, president of the American Polygraph Association. Hundreds of police departments and corporations throughout the world utilize the polygraph to separate truth from deception. The 94% accuracy of the polygraph has been well documented not only in real life situations as we've discussed here, but in laboratory and university studies that have been conducted throughout the world. The odds against six people successfully deceiving a trained polygraph examiner on a single issue are over a million to one. The polygraph evidence in the Travis Walton case is strong enough to stand as proof in a court of law in many states. In order to understand where the beings that kidnapped Travis Walton may have originated, we must first understand our place in the universe. Our sun is only one of over 150 billion stars in our galaxy, the Milky Way. There are billions and billions of galaxies in the universe. If only one star in every million has planets that can support life, then there are hundreds of billions of life-supporting planets in the universe. Within 55 light years of our own solar system, there are thousands of stars. 46 of these near neighbors are similar to the sun and can be expected to have planets and life, especially if colonization and migration have been going on for part of their 10 billion year lives. By examining our own advanced technology closely, we can get some indications as to how the UFO that kidnapped Travis Walton may have been propelled and how it could have traveled through space to the Earth. The technology to travel to nearby stars in our own galaxy now exists just as the basic technology to go to the moon existed shortly after World War II. Technological progress is the result of inventing new systems and not perfecting old ones. We cross the Atlantic Ocean 100 times faster now than 200 years ago. Not because we've got boats that go 100 times faster, but because we now have jet airliners. Today we take jet airliners for granted but 200 years ago, they would have sounded like the wildest kind of fantasy. It took Magellan two years to sail around the planet, and it only takes a modern astronaut 90 minutes to circle the Earth. The Apollo project not only proved that it was possible for mankind to leave the Earth and visit our nearest neighbor in space, the moon, 
it revealed that even the most prestigious scientists often underestimate the ability of human ingenuity to accomplish what is considered impossible. In 1957, Lee DeForest, the inventor of the vacuum tube and father of modern electronics, stated that no matter what the inventions of the future, man would never land on the moon and bring back samples to Earth. Just 12 years after that, millions of people on the Earth were able to watch the first moon landing on television as it happened. When trying to understand UFOs, it is important to be careful about using the word impossible because the history of our own technology shows that intelligent beings have a habit of accomplishing what was once considered impossible. Today, some people consider it impossible to travel the vast distances between stars. The state of current technology already indicates that their ideas will soon be as obsolete as Mr. DeForest's statement that man would never land on the moon. We could build nuclear-powered starships that could travel in space just the way this submarine travels underwater. These starships could travel to nearby stars and return within the lifetime of a man. They would be powered by nuclear fusion, the energy source of the sun, and the same nuclear process used in the hydrogen bomb. An advanced starship capable of traveling close to the speed of light could take advantage of Einstein's law of relativity, which has now been experimentally verified. As the spaceship approached the speed of light, the objects that they approach would take on a red glow. Time would begin to slow down for the crew. When they reached 99.999% of the speed of light, they could travel to a star 37 light years away in just two months pilot time. The people that they left behind would be 37 years older, but the crew of this starship would have aged only two months. The space shuttle will be able to lift portions of a giant nuclear fission or fusion rocket into orbit around the Earth where it could be assembled. From there, it could be launched to other solar systems. The space shuttle will also be used to build and supply space stations. Astronauts have already stayed in space for five months. We are rapidly approaching a time when there will be a permanent space colony and there will always be Earthlings in space. on Earth is destined to become a space traveling culture and our space age is less than 25 years old. Who could possibly estimate the technological limits of a space traveling culture that is a billion years older than our own? This UFO caused severe static on the photographer's transistor radio as it maneuvered overhead. Reports of UFOs causing magnetic disturbance such as the interruption of television and radio transmissions and interference with the electrical systems of cars are common. This electrical interference strongly suggests that at least one UFO atmospheric propulsion system is based on some kind of electromagnetic propulsion. The first successful test of an electromagnetic propulsion system was conducted on Earth in 1966, when this electromagnetic submarine was first demonstrated. It cost only $2,000 to build. Its homemade look is reminiscent of the Wright Brothers airplane. It clearly demonstrates the potential for magnetic propulsion. This electromagnetic submarine moves through the water as a result of electromagnetic forces. 
It has absolutely no moving parts. Ionized air is an electrically conductive substance just like seawater. This film was taken from a space capsule returning to Earth. It shows air ionized by the extreme heat of re-entry. The glowing ionized air seen around the space capsule is very similar to the glowing effect photographed around UFOs and described by UFO witnesses. UFOs may be propelled by some sort of advanced electromagnetic system that is foreshadowed by this primitive submarine, just as Goddard's rockets foreshadowed this advanced rocket. The Travis Walton case is not the only well-documented instance of a person being abducted by a UFO. These books record many such cases. Perhaps the best known abduction of all, and one of the earliest reported, is the abduction of a well-respected New England couple, Betty and Barney Hill. Barney Hill died in February of 1969, eight years after their UFO experience on September 20th, 1961. Their experience has been described in a book, The Interrupted Journey, and a movie, The UFO Incident. Betty and Barney Hill were driving along a deserted road at two o'clock in the morning on their way to their New Hampshire home from Montreal. Suddenly we began to see a strange light in the sky, which was maneuvering in a very erratic pattern. This light began flying along beside us and did this for about 30 miles until we came to an area known as Indian Head. And at that place, this light left the top of the mountain came out over the highway and stopped in midair directly in front of us. Bonnie jumped out of the car with the binoculars in an attempt to try to identify this craft. Because this was, we knew nothing about UFOs at the time. Bonnie walked towards it, looking up through the binoculars, and he could see a red light on each side and figures standing behind the double row of windows. He panicked and he ran back to the car saying they planned to capture us and we had to get out of there. And we went speeding down the highway. And at that point, we heard beeping sounds and the car vibrated. Now, when we arrived home, we had many puzzles. The tops of Barney's shoes were scuffed. Our watches had stopped functioning. There were highly polished spots in the trunk of the car. But the biggest mystery of all was the fact that it had taken us seven hours to drive 190 miles. The Hills reported their sighting of a UFO to nearby Pease Air Force Base. For fear of ridicule, they left out their observation of alien beings. During the next two years, Betty Hill was haunted by nightmares and Barney developed a debilitating ulcer. Fearing that the ulcer and nightmares were rooted in the two hours of lost time, the Hills sought the help of Dr. Benjamin Simon, a psychiatrist and expert in regressive hypnosis. Dr. Simon conducted weekly hypnosis sessions with each of the hills separately. He would induce amnesia in each of the hills after every session to make sure they couldn't discuss or exchange information about what they remembered. After three months, a clear picture of their abduction emerged and Barney's ulcer had been cured. At that point, Dr. Simon played for them a composite tape of all of the sessions, and the Hills found out the truth about the two missing hours. It was at this point, the beings that had been on the craft were now standing in the middle of the road, a dirt road blocking our way. The car motor stalled. They separated, came up on each side, took us out of the car, and at that point, I realized that they undoubtedly planned to take us on board. And that even increased my fears. So that actually, by the time we had arrived at the craft, I was fighting. I was in a panic. They just held me. After Mrs. Hill's examination by the aliens had been completed, 
she had an opportunity to speak with the leader of the aliens. When I asked the leader where he was from, I said, I know you're not from this planet. And this is when I saw the star map. It looked almost like I was looking out a window. It had dimension to it. It was about three or four feet long and about two feet high. There were all these balls of light in it. And the leader explained to me that the heavy lines, the places they go all the time or frequently, the broken lines were expeditions. He asked me if I knew where I was on the map. And I told him no, that I knew nothing about astronomy. And so he said, if, if I did not know where I was on the map, then there was no point of trying to explain it to me. I just didn't have the necessary knowledge. Betty drew the star map she had seen on board the spacecraft, and it appeared in her book. Because there was no indication of which star was the sun, the best way that this map could be interpreted would be to build a large, three-dimensional model of the sun and all the stars near the sun. The one person who decided to take on this difficult task was Marjorie Fish. When I first started, I expected to find many similar patterns to Betty's drawing. But exactly the opposite happened. Because of the peculiar spacing of the stars near the sun, it was impossible for Marjorie Fish to find a match of more than four or five of the 12 pattern stars in the star map. Then she began to focus on the stars that were most like the sun and most likely to have planets and life. Finally, only the very best stars for life were left. And when that happened, I had a nine-point match. In 1969, a new star catalog came out giving more accurate distances between stars. Marjorie made a new model based on those distances and disregarded all stars except the ones most likely to have planets and life. The whole pattern stood out, including three background stars. Now, this was a very, very exciting thing for me. The 15-point match achieved by Marjorie Fish of the Betty Hill star map is unique and goes far beyond the laws of chance. Despite the fact that Marjorie Fish tried thousands of different combinations of stars to try to match Betty's pattern, she was able to find one and only one pattern that matched angle for angle, line length for line length, what Betty had drawn. The star pattern makes sense from nearest star to nearest star to nearest star. The sun is part of the pattern. Quite remarkably, every one of the stars in the pattern is the right kind for planets and life. And all of the right kind of stars for planets and life in this volume of space are part of the pattern. The chance of that happening by accident, all the right kind and only the right kind for pattern stars, is one in several thousand. Perhaps most remarkably, this work tells us where one set of visitors originates. The base stars Zeta-1 and Zeta-2 reticuli are a very special pair of stars. Zeta-1 and Zeta-2 reticuli are the closest to each other pair of stars suitable for planets and life in our entire neighborhood. Instead of being isolated from their neighbors as we are, Zeta-1 and Zeta-2 are a hundred times closer to each other than we are to our nearest neighbor. It would not be surprising if space travel developed earlier between such close neighbors. Zeta-1 and 2 reticuli are over a billion years older than Earth, clearly giving any beings living there a long evolutionary head start on Ohio State University to get an expert opinion about the validity of Marjorie Fish's star map work. Professor Walter Mitchell has been a professional astronomer for over 20 years. It uh, took me quite a long time to gain a full appreciation for the work of Marjorie Fish, but uh, it's become apparent over the years that, um, first of all, the work is, without question, accurate. The proven validity of her star map enormously increases the credibility of the remainder of Mrs. Hill's story. I was taken into the first room, Barney into the second room, where we were given, uh, as the leader, as I call him, gave us testing. There were 11 beings, and for purposes of identification, I called one the leader, because he seemed to be in charge of the project of doing this testing, and he was the only one who spoke English. 
Then there was the examiner who did the testing. And then there were nine others we called crew members. They stayed outside the room in the corridor. Our examinations were very much similar in that with both Barney and I, they checked our eyes, ears, nose, throat, took samples of our hair, fingernail, and they scraped our skin. With me, they touched my body with little points on wires. They said he was checking my nervous system. And then they attempted to insert a needle-like instrument in my navel. I objected that it would hurt, and he said it shouldn't hurt. When he did this, it caused a great deal of pain. He said it was a pregnancy test, and I said, well, that's no pregnancy test here. Betty Hill was right. In 1961, there was no pregnancy test like that here on Earth. But in the early 1970s, two techniques, amniocentesis and laparoscopy, have both come into wide usage. Both are techniques that provide information about pregnancy and bear a striking resemblance to the experience that Betty Hill described. It's difficult to imagine Betty Hill inventing medical techniques that did not yet exist on Earth unless her UFO experience actually occurred. When the alien leader saw the pain that Betty was experiencing, he put his hand on her head and the pain went away. At this point, uh, the examiner came running back into the room and opened my mouth and started tugging at my teeth. And I said to the leader, what is he doing? And he said, we're very, very puzzled. Why are Barney's teeth removable and yours are not? At that point, we left the craft and went back to the car and we stood there by the car and we watched the craft leave. We saw it become surrounded by a fiery, revolving mass of some kind. We could see the UFO in the middle of this. And it lifted up, dipped down, went right straight up, and was gone. I received a copy of the radar report from Pease Air Force Base, where they had tracked an unidentified craft at 2.14 AM, in the mo about the time, just about the time we estimate that the UFO left. We went back and we found the spot where we were captured. It was not a fantasy. It was a real experience. And I believe that I have enough evidence to establish that. I first met Betty and Barney Hill in November 1968. I've spent a great deal of time since then investigating their abduction. I've talked to Dr. Benjamin Simon about his hypnosis sessions. I've listened to the tapes of those sessions. And I've looked at Marjorie Fish's star map work in great depth. It seems clear to me that Betty and Barney Hill were taken on board a flying saucer in New Hampshire in 1961. The story must be taken at face value. It's true. I think for a long, long time I had the feeling that I had sort of lived through a tragedy in some way. And sometimes even now I still have this feeling because it's something that's haunting. It's something that's always on my mind, no matter where I go or what I do, because I do lead a very active life and I have many, many interests, but always that's on the back of my mind. It's the last thing I think of when I go to bed at night and it's the first thing that I think of in the morning when I wake up. And uh, I expect it'll probably be that way for the rest of my life. Ted Phillips' research into UFO landing sites revealed amazing information as to the frequency with which alien beings have been observed visiting the Earth. You find a surprising number of instances in which humanoids are reported uh, near the landed UFO. Some 22% or 325 cases uh, involve humanoids, generally described as small in size, kind of pale gray skin, little if any hair, wide set, quite prominent eyes, thin spindly bodies, slightly enlarged heads, and wearing tight-fitting diver's suit, as it is generally described. In over 50 of the cases, uh, there were found small footprints correlating, of course, with the small uh, humanoid scene. Dr. Leo Sprinkle, a state psychologist who has examined 20 UFO abductees, says that they are absolutely sane 
responsible people of great courage. He could find no mental aberration in any of the people that he examined. People who took the trouble to talk to me and investigate the thing saw that it, you know, obviously must have happened just as we reported it. The overwhelming picture that emerges from UFO abductions is that the alien beings are examining and studying earthlings much the way that we examine and study wild animals. Dr. James Harder is a professor of civil engineering at the University of California at Berkeley. We visited him at his home. Professor Harder is one of the leading experts in the world concerning UFO abduction. He has hypnotized both Betty Hill and Travis Walton. He was also one of the 12 scientists to present overwhelming evidence at the U.S. congressional hearings indicating that some UFOs are extraterrestrial spacecraft. Professor Harder has used hypnosis to aid hundreds of people in remembering the details of their UFO experiences and believes that much of our confusion in dealing with a large number of UFO abduction reports stems from the fact that there are many different alien groups visiting the Earth. One of these UFO abductees is Pat Roach. She and her daughter were apparently abducted by alien beings on a flying saucer that landed near their home in Utah. Visualize just what's in front of you there. And tell me what it is that your eyes see. I'd say he's about, I'm not good at height, but possibly three and a half foot tall. He is a little people. He's skinny, but he's not, he's still in proportion. I see. Although his arms are long. What was it, the impression that you got? They can't really interfere. They ask me what I liked and what I didn't like, and they ask me, how I felt about things, how I felt about other people, and how I felt about pain. And then they took me back to instances in my life where I had had these feelings, and that's not right. It's not right to do that to people. They were just trying to learn as much as they could. And then they would tell me where my children were. There, Pat, your children are all right. There's nothing going to be bothering them. They're perfectly safe. There's no reason for you to feel this upset. One of the things that's a pretty good earmark of authenticity, beyond any reasonable doubt, is the welling up of a strong emotional reaction during the time that a person is reliving an experience under hypnosis. The spontaneity the emotional reaction, the quick tears and terror. When you come across that sort of thing, it's sometimes awe-inspiring. When those strange beings started walking up to the car, I was so terrified that even now when I think about it, I wonder how I actually lived through it. To be able to see a UFO close up leaves one a feeling uh, very insignificant. My connection with the UFO phenomena has certainly changed my outlook on life. I, I, don't, I feel much freer knowing that there's an infinite expansion of knowledge in existence out there, that we aren't stuck with the limitations that we think we, we thought. Man has always wondered about his place in the universe. Once, it was a matter of conventional wisdom and religious doctrine that the Earth was the center of the universe and the sun and moon moved around it. In 1543, Nicholas Copernicus realized that, in reality, the Earth was moving around the sun, as were the other planets. Giordano Bruno, the man who first publicly proclaimed Copernicus's views, was burned at the stake, and Copernicus's discovery was successfully suppressed for over 200 years. The realization that UFOs are someone else's spacecraft completes the job that Copernicus started in discovering that the Earth was not the center of the universe.
New ideas which change man's conception of himself and his universe come into acceptance not because their opponents come to believe in them, but because their opponents die and a new generation grows up that is accustomed to them. Many of the ideas presented in this film definitely challenge our present conception of our place in the universe. However, the evidence supporting these ideas is so strong that it cannot be ignored by open-minded people seeking the truth. Gordon Cooper's letter to the United Nations verifying his UFO experience. 1,400 UFO landing sites where the UFO affected the soil. General Nathan Twining's classified letter revealing the Air Force's knowledge of the reality of flying disks. J. Edgar Hoover's handwritten memo asking for access to captured flying saucers. Major Marcel's recovery of a crashed UFO. Computer-analyzed photographs of UFOs. The six polygraph tests verifying the reality of Travis Walton's UFO experience. The evidence we have presented establishes well beyond a reasonable doubt that alien beings are visiting the Earth in extraterrestrial spacecraft. The next section of this film makes it even more difficult to ignore the reality of these extraterrestrial visitors. One of the most convincing UFO cases of all time began in January 1975 in Switzerland. The experience begins in a UFO abduction case. A Swiss farmer was taken aboard a spacecraft, articulated words with the occupants, and began an exchange of information that has continued on and is going on today, still going on today. The spacecraft flew out of the blue and landed. The occupant got out and stood in the grass and sat on the grass and talked to the man, and they had an exchange that lasted 20 minutes, and there have been 116 contacts since then. Case involved a Mr. Billy Meyer, in response to his question, they said that they come from the Pleiades. They said that they are here observing humanity, that they have information, some of the information is of a scientific nature, and that he would be asked to pass it to other people. They say that they are not gods, they're not superior people, they are men just like we are men. And he's taken hundreds of photographs of the Pleiadian spacecraft operating in Swiss airspace. And this has all been checked by the computer. The computer says that this object is on the order of 20 feet in diameter and about 120 yards away. It agrees with what the witness said about the diameter. He says it's seven meters in diameter, it's about 21 feet. He took messages, he copied notes from the Pleiadians, wrote them down over 2,000 pages worth. Here's a book of 600 pages that I have translated into English so far, and this represents one-fourth, one-fourth of the notes. We have no case on record with that volume of information delivered by extraterrestrial contacts to a contactee, a UFO contactee. And the information in there is just staggering, just phenomenal. The information covers technical and scientific data as best they can explain it to us in terms of the words that we use in our technology. It gets into spiritual problems, spiritual development of man and our relationship to deity. It, has, it describes uh, other existences in space. Other human beings living in other planetary environments. They're here because they're concerned about us, their younger brothers. Our technical potentials have exceeded our spiritual capability of handling the information. And we are now in a position where we can destroy ourselves and we don't have the spiritual development to prevent it. And they, we're, because of this, we have become a laboratory experiment. They are waiting to see what we're going to do. As a matter of fact, they don't see us solving the problem. They see us as a, an insane society rushing headlong to destruction. And that only a, a, a change of mass mind on a mass scale can influence it. And they don't see this happening. And that's staggering because it's us that's involved. <laughs> In the 1980s, with growing public interest and acceptance of extraterrestrials, it is hoped that present and future administrations will be more honest and forthright in releasing information concerning these and other visitations.